that I'm going to ask you to stand again. We're going to go into our congregational song, which is called Here For You. It is a new song, but the words will be on the screens and just follow along. The song talks about just being here for God, to worship God. So as you are here, think about what it is that you want. The same way um, the king granted Nehemiah's request is the same way that I know God, as long as our motives are pure and what we want to do is for the, in the will of God that he will grant your requests. Amen. Here for you.
thankful this afternoon for the goodness of the Lord that we are in his house. Amen. Amen. And I give God thanks for every one of you who are here today in the house of worship. This is the place we come to congregate together because our worship starts before we get here. Amen. Amen. So we just come here to do worship together. And I'm glad that you're here this morning, uh, this afternoon today. If you are visiting with us for the first time, you are welcome. Just indicate by just lifting your hands. If you're visiting with us for the first time, yes, and your name is? Joy. Good to have you with us, Joy. Anybody else visiting with us for the first time? Yes, you're over there. Amen. And your name is? Ella. Ella. Good to have you. I'm assuming that your sister Ferris is friend. Yes. Yes. Sister Ferris, is your, has she come from Oxford? Yes. She's come from Oxford to be. Sister Ferris has come to us from the church in Oxford. So she's settling in she's settled in this part of the country and she's she's been worshipping with us for the last three weeks. So Sister Ferris, just can't let other people see you. And, 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 and when when the when the administrative bishop of the country tells you that Dudley is a church that you must go, <laughs> then we need to recognize her, amen? amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then she she's brought a friend with her today, and her son is with her. I know you're covering your face, <laughs> but she's here, she's living up here with her son, and it's good to have you, so make them welcome, amen? amen. amen. Achieve the 
finished product, quite a number of experts then are involved. And believe me, I know, I've been through the process of having to have a new building done. First, there is a person who commissioned the project. Then there are consultants who will help to bring the project to its fruition, such as the architect, who is employed to ensure that you have a blueprint to work to. Then you have a quantity surveyor, Brother Norman knows, and, and anybody else that I miss out, you can place them in the sermon. You need a quantity surveyor, you need an electrical engineer, you need mechanical engineer, am I right, Brother Norman? And the construction company who is charged with the responsibility of constructing the building. The construction company will commission other workers such as plumbers, bricklayers, carpenters, painters, roofers, tilers, and will amass a labor force to carry out the work. And that's what that construction company will do. In addition to that, there is the project manager whose responsibility it is to ensure that the, the company who is uh, commissioned to do the work don't uh, overrun the project. Amen. So they are commissioned to ensure that the one who, uh, you know, and so because if your project overrun, you know what you're talking about now? Escalation of cost, unnecessary cost. And in Nehemiah, God found a project manager. Amen. God found such a project manager in Nehemiah who was skillful enough and encouraging enough to motivate a group of people. And he was firm enough uh, to motivate a group of people who were discouraged. They were the, 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 the people the returnees, and they had settled in the, in the land of, you know, uh, and um, things that happened, the walls were burnt down because Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded Judah in 586 BC, and he took the young men away and carried people away into captivity into Babylon, and not only that, they burned the city with fire. And so they were left with walls that were, a city burned, walls that were broken down. And you can tell how the people, you can just imagine how the people felt. They felt discouraged, those who were left during that period. And those who were in exile were also discouraged because they remembered that their city was destroyed. So he was working with a group of discouraged people, but God found in him this good project manager. Yeah. Who was Nehemiah? He was a wine taster, and I know some of us would love that job. <laughs> he was a wine taster, right? Yeah, now don't pretend you don't drink wine. Now you're, not, you're not fooling me, not I'm fooling no wool over my eye, some people, because when we come to church, all of us are very holy. <laughs> holy to the point where we won't even touch water.
He was not oblivious to the abuse of his people and the embarrassment they were living with every day. Can you imagine? Every day, these people, there was Nehemiah in Persia, enjoying the niceties of Persia. But back home in Judah, the city was destroyed and the people were demoralized. And so he was not oblivious to their embarrassment that they were living every day with a city that was exposed to danger. And so he had a concern. You know, when you see things, you get a concern. And what do you do when you get a concern? You do something about it. He just wasn't only concerned about it, he decided to do something about it. Nehemiah was concerned with, with its political and geographical restoration because if you had a city in them ancient times whose wall was uh, broken down, um, you, you, you would be exposed to attack from, uh, from, uh, from the other nations around you. So in those ancient times then, Jerusalem could hardly be considered a city at all because the walls were destroyed. And any credible city would have its walls intact. So if you were leading in that city at that time, you, you would, nobody would be respectful of you because your city was exposed. So Nehemiah then, way down in Persia, thinking about what was happening back home, because he was absent from home, it didn't mean that he didn't care. And that sometimes when, you know, when we're not involved in the thing and we're not fronting it and we're not in, we, we, we just, we sort of take a back seat and say, let those who are there live and get on with it. But Nehemiah did not take that stance. Nehemiah set about correcting the vulnerability of the city and its residents by firstly getting permission from Artaxerxes. He asked, uh, if you read chapter, the chapter prior to that, and in chapter two, and in the first part of chapter two as well, he, he, he sought permission from Artaxerxes. He just didn't get up and, and, and take himself off to rebuild the walls of, uh, of Jerusalem. He asked for permission because he was in the employment of the king. So he asked permission. So he knew protocol. Amen. So, and, and then he asked for provision because he was going back to, to build the place. So he said, I'm asking your permission. And then he asked for permission. He asked for uh, wood and, you know, a letter to go and get wood and timber and whatever from people to help to build the wall. And then he also asked for protection for the rebuilding of the walls, which were all granted by the king. So he knew how to do his business. So he just didn't take off on his own and just do things. Nehemiah had a good approach to the task of rebuilding the, the city walls. He went, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he didn't immediately um, set about rebuilding the walls. He, he, he went on a reconnaissance mission of, after a few days to secure, uh, after he secured the approval of the king. And what did he do? He inspected the walls by night. He, he, he inspected the walls by night. I know I'm telling you a story, but I'm building something. He inspected the walls by night. And it could be that he wanted to check the strength of the remains of the walls to, to ascertain whether it could withstand the repair work. Because remember, those walls were ruined walls. So if he was going to rebuild those walls, he had to know whether the walls, the, what was left, the remains, could take new work being done on top of them. And it could be that he thought, let me inspect these walls to see if I could, can really do them. 
And if I can't do, if I can't do nothing with them, I, I will leave quietly <laughs> and go back to Persia and assume my role as a wine taster. So it could be that he has those views in mind. So a, a, ve a very valuable lesson for us to learn is this. Those of us who would we, let me put some spiritual context to it. If we would rebuild the walls of, of the church, I'm not talking about the physical wall of this building, but the walls of our spiritual life, we must first take notice of the ruins of the wall. It's no good trying to rebuild something if we don't take notice of the ruins of the wall. Sometimes, that's why I, be, I, I firmly believe in knowing what I'm going to pray about. Um, and, and you just don't pray loosely and hit and miss. You know what you're praying about. And if you're going to call a, 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 an all-night prayer meeting, uh, it must be specific. We must be praying into yes, things. So yes, those of us yes. who would rebuild the spiritual walls of our lives mm -hmm. and the church must first take notice of the ruins of the walls. Amen? Amen. So after inspection... He revealed the purpose of his visit. You see how stage by stage uh, he, re he, he approached his task. He first went, he, 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 he sought permission from the king, he asked for permission from the king, and he asked for, for protection. Then he got there, and, and, and he got there, and then he went and surveyed the walls to see what could be done with the walls. And it was only then, after his survey of the walls by night, that uh, he, he revealed the purpose of his return, of his visit to the people. And this was his second visit to Jerusalem, you know. This was not his first visit. He had visited before. And this was his second time going there. And he revealed to the people the purpose of his visit. He was there, he says, I'm here to rebuild the walls. I'm not just here on an excursion. I'm not here on a holiday. I'm here to do something specific. And so Nehemiah recognized that in rebuilding those walls, he was going to need people. He's going to need people. Without, no leader can do anything without the support of people. Are you hearing me? You, you can't do anything without the support of people. Any leader who, who tells you that they can do everything by themselves, don't believe them. They, they, they burn themselves out. They definitely burn themselves out. You need the support of people. If you're working in any ministry, you need the support of people. You need people. I need people. Whatever we're going to accomplish in Woodside, we need people. When God called Moses, he fixed him up with Aaron. When God, and then after Aaron, Joshua was his little protege, watching. Amen. When when uh, God uh, called Elijah, was it Elijah was that the older of the two, then after that, Elisha joined him. We need people, amen? Leaders need people, and I'm saying it again, leaders need people. And I'm not talking about just me, I'm talking about whichever area of, of leadership you function in, Leaders need people. So when we ask you to support us, even if, even if you can't do it now, just say something. Just don't ignore people's requests. Just say something. Leaders need people. In your home, you're the leader. You, you know, in your home, you need people. Amen. In the family, you need people. You need people to support you. So he called on the people after inspecting the wall to give to say to give them to tell them the purpose of him coming there. I'm going to rebuild the walls and rebuilding the wall, but not just for that's what I've been struggling with the last two weeks. It was not just for Nehemiah's problem, uh, Benny. 
benefit, it would be for everybody. If those walls were rebuilt, everybody would benefit from the building of the wall. So how was this feat going to be accomplished then? He first issued an invitation. He issued an invitation to the people. What did he say? Come and let us build the walls of Jerusalem. You see how inclusive it was. His invitation was inclusive. It was not just selective. When it, when it was San Balat and Tobias, it was selective because they were troublemakers. They didn't want, he didn't want them involved in the building project. But we don't have no San Balat and Tobias down there at Woodside. Amen. We don't have none of that down here. We have people like the people near my found, the willing workers. Come and let us build the walls of Jerusalem. That was his invitation. His invitation was inclusive. If he was going to accomplish what God had placed in his heart, because remember, God had placed it in his heart, he recognized that he could not do it alone. I don't believe in one man back, and you know that by now. I do not believe in one man band. I don't. <laughs> I don't believe in one man band. This is why I, I, I struggle with, with, with a church that I struggle. I really do struggle with church fellowship that is just this church fellowship existing on its own. They don't have no covering. They don't come under no leadership of anybody. They're not answerable to anybody. They're just by themselves doing their own thing. I have, uh, I, I can see, I can pick a lot of holes in, 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 in our church organization. But I'll tell you what, I love it because I have a covering. I have somebody I'm answerable to and everybody's answerable to somebody. It has leadership, it has a structure, and I don't believe in anything that don't have no structure. You don't have to agree with me, but that's me. I just like structure in my life. I just like structure. If I don't know what I'm doing, trust me, tomorrow I know what I'm doing tomorrow already. I don't get up in the morning and say, Lord, what am I going to do today? No, my life is structured. I like structure in my life. And so he recognized that he could not do it alone. It required joint effort. If you're going to build anything together, it requires joint effort. All hands to the wheel. And it's not one person pushing and the other pulling. We are all pushing. If we say push, what we do? Push. And if I say pull, push. all right. <laughs> That's what we do. So we are doing it together. He was God's project manager. But he needed the people to participate. If we're going to build together, we need the participation, the unity of everybody. Amen. All good leaders know that they need people. We need people. We All good leaders know that. And uh, sometimes people can frustrate you. Sometimes they don't do it on time. Sometimes they don't do it when you want them to do it. Sometimes you see the time scale is, you know, time is slipping away and things that you have requested to be done, you, it's not getting done. Then what you do, you start jumping <laughs> and you start to do it yourself. But that's not, it's not always good. Because but you want, what do you want to do? You want to deliver your program that you have. That's why we need people. So I'm saying to the church today that we need you. Amen? Amen? This may not be the message you come here to hear this morning, but you're, we need you. I need to talk to you. We need you. The men's fellowship leader needs you. The women's ministry uh, leader needs you. The superintendent in Sunday school needs you. Um, whatever the missions and evangelism people need you, the prayer people need you, we need people. Amen. 
We need each other. Then, so he issued his invitation, come and let us build the walls of Jerusalem. Couldn't be clearer. There was no ifs or but. Our instructions, our requests need to be clear. This is why when I ask you for money, I tell you what it's for. I'm not one of those leaders who will get up and ask you for offerings and money and you don't know what it's about. And when you give it, I'm telling you how much you have given. Because I, do, I, I believe in transparency right across the board. And that's how you get people. So that's instruction for you. When you're in leadership, make sure you're transparent with people. So, amen. Especially when you're asking for people's life. Because money, you know, equal to people, like they work for it, they sweat for it. <laughs> Amen. So then, we need people. And we need one another. Amen. Amen. What, a, what, a, how, how miserable it would be if I don't have another Christian in my life. Let, forget certain things. We need one another. Amen. I need someone to encourage me. I need someone to pray with me. We need one another. And I'm not just talking about, um, I'm not just, I'm just talking about uh, just for, to eat, just to pray only. We need people to socialize with. We need to have a social, we need people to socialize with. This is why the church is a place, you know, people come, people come to church. To, to have fellowship. We need each other. Amen. Oh, Lord. Am I talking sense? We need each other. We need each other. We need each other. So then, when he issued his invitation, the people says, let us get up and build. Amen. Then he made an invitation. He offered an invitation, and then they made a proclamation. They said, let us rise up and build. Get up. Stop being idle. Do something. And they started to see the reality of their plight. We are exposed to danger because the walls are broken down and burnt with fire. So they said, let us rise up and build. Their willingness is evident by their response. No, but, I, you know, it just didn't, I didn't hear this Bible saying that they looked around and says, well, are you going to do it? Are you going to help? <laughs> are you going to help? Are you going to participate? Are you going to join in? What do you think we should do? Do you think we should, do you think we should listen to Nehemiah? Do you think we should, do you think it's a good idea that we should, because that's how we do things sometimes. We ask everybody's opinion before we make a decision. And we look, do you think we should support that? Do you think that's a good idea? No. They must have had, the Bible says, the people say, let us rise up and build. So they motivated themselves. We have to motivate ourselves when it comes to God's business. We have to motivate ourselves. Sometimes we wait for other people to motivate us. But we have to motivate ourselves. You've got to have a little motivation button on you. That when everybody is not jumping, you push yours. <laughs> and you get excited about God's business. Because if you're waiting for everybody else to get excited, you may never get excited yourself. So you have to have a little self-motivation button where you push it and you get, you sing your song, you praise your God, you clap your hand, and you make your own confession and say, I am going to be involved in God's business. Let us rise up and build. The response of the people around a leader is important in respect of the leader's encouragement. How do you think Nehemiah 
someone asks, you know, for, for something to be done and you don't show willing, you, the, the leader gets discouraged, trust me. And, and you can drive a leader to a discouragement point by just your non-response. So they all proved willing and showed unity of strength. And what I liked about this group of people, all of them were not doing the same thing. They all had different tasks. And they knew what they were capable of. So some were building sheep gear, some were building fish gear, some were building different different gates, some were carrying the mortar, some were doing the walls, some were all kind of things. Then they, they cleared up rubbish. They were just doing all kind of things. They knew what all of them were doing. They had one aim and objective, and that was to complete that wall. One aim and objective, and that was to complete that wall. And that we saw unity around that wall. And we hear all the time that unity is strength. Unity is strength. And so they were united. And they said, let us rise up and build. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah felt good. Amen. Oh, when I saw you walking up here today and putting the money in the bucket, you don't know how good I felt. <laughs> <laughs> and I know some of you had given yours prior uh, to, to today because you've been giving it over time. And there may be some of you who have, you know, you're struggling to do it. But don't let the timing put you off. Still do it when you can. You know, um, there was a little proverb. Those of you who are not from Jamaican uh, origin and background may not understand it. But then you will understand it. My, there's a little, there's a little um, tuba. It's a tuba. Um, and we call it um, Coco. And my grandmother, we call it Coco. And what do you call it, Sister Tara? Them little things. Edus. You know, Edus. Them little Edus. Tiny little Edus. But in the Jamaicans call them Coco. You know, trust me, because we call everything different. <laughs> and so my, my grandmother used to say, uh, what, what, Coco? <laughs> so every, it means every egg or every, every two, every, every edu you put in the basket, start making the basket get a bit fuller. Amen. So you have an apple tree. Every apple you put in that basket makes the basket start getting fuller. So if you do a bit at a time, then you know, it will get too much. Amen. So I'm not discouraging you. I'm trying to encourage you how to participate. So you, you, all of us are different and we have different needs. But we need to encourage one another. Amen? Amen. So the people, Nehemiah felt good when the people start to build. And the Bible says they didn't only say, let us rise up and build. They didn't only talk about it. That's one good thing to talk, you know. Because I tell you, a lot of us have talked. Oh, man. And if talk could go to town, <laughs> we would come back with a whole different shopping. <laughs> if talk could go to town. <laughs> because we can talk and talk and talk. If we could take talk to the supermarket, we'd come back with basket full. <laughs> because we talk a lot. But then, they didn't only talk the, and say, let us rise up and build. They show 
as they had a common cause. Oh, hallelujah. We have a common cause in God to, to build, not only to contribute to his work, and I'm not just talking about boiler now, I'm talking about his work overall. We have a common cause to build and to, to sow into the kingdom of God and to give of our time and our effort to the kingdom of God. We have a common cause. Because Jesus has called us not to be idle, but to be active in his kingdom. We are called to be active people in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. We are workers together with Christ. That's what Paul calls us. Is it Paul? Workers together with Christ. They had a common cause, so they set their hands to the work. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, set your hands to the work of God. Amen. Let's set our hands to God's work and do what he has called us to do. And wherever he has placed you, whatever he has placed in your heart and what he has called you to do, set your hands to it. Don't just talk about it. Set your hands to it and do it to the glory of God, amen? amen. And when others are called and are, uh, 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 are calling for help, if at all possible, ensure that we are giving support to God's kingdom, to his work. And those people, what seemed like a mammoth task oh. to other people, was completed in 52 days, 52 days to the amazement of their critics. I tell you, when the church gets united, our enemy will stand in amazement. Hallelujah. We will confound the devil when we stand in unity. And in 52 days, they completed the wall. It was completed because they had determined minds and busy hands. <coughs> determined minds and busy hands in 52 days. Determined minds and busy hands. 52 days, they completed that wall, their walls, and restored Jerusalem as a place that was secure and enemies, invaders, wouldn't just feel they could come in and out because walls around a city were very important. And so invaders, and you know, those, those, those other guys that we, we don't really want to talk about them today, Sam Ballot, the Horror Knight, you hear what you hear, hear what the Horror Knight, you know? <laughs> He was a horror knight. <laughs> Some ballad, the horror knight. <laughs> he, 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 he was very critical of what they, they, they were doing and wanted to stop them doing the work. But when you stand together like these people and the enemy sees, you will confound the enemy. There's nothing he can do. Yes. Don't alienate yourself. You know what the enemy likes in when we alienate ourselves from each other and cut ourselves off from each other. You know when I have a problem and a crisis in my life, the first first people I want in my life is the church. First people. Some people may disagree with me, but it's the first people. Sometimes you don't always say the right thing <laughs> to me. But then, I still need the church. Amen. Amen. We need the church. We need the support Amen. of each other. Yes. Because I tell you what, when we let other people in, um, the enemy sometimes set up blocks in our minds. Mm -hmm. and, and let me just say this. Set up, he set up, he allows us to think that the church is the worst place mm -hmm. that you could ever be when you have yes. something going on. Yes. 
That's what, and we become suspicious of each other. That's the enemy allowing us to think that way. Because when you start thinking that way, the enemy now is having a field day, and, and you'll be suspicious of everybody. But I tell you what, there are people behind here praying, praying for me. Praying for me. I believe people are praying for me. Brother Leroy, I know people are praying for me. Sometimes when I'm not even thinking about it, I get a call from people I haven't heard from for a long time. And they say, we are praying for you. I thank God for the church. Come on, give God thanks for the church. Give God thanks for the church. Of Nehemiah's wall 
was a benefit to the residents and allow their enemies to recognize that they were a formidable force. It benefited them and their enemies realized that you can't mess with these people. When we stand in unity, the enemy will know that he can't mess with us. But when we stand alone, that's when he plays with our minds. Amen? We can only benefit when we pull our efforts behind a worthwhile cause. And that's to do kingdom work. When we are isolated, the enemy plays with our mind. Some of my worst moments, when I think all kind of horrors, horrible things, is when, you know, you're on your own. I don't know about you. And when you're by yourself and you start thinking, you know, one of the things the enemy keeps letting me think about now. But wait a minute. Oh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a practical thing. But if I'm not careful, I'll, I, I will allow it to become a big thing. Because you know, I keep thinking with a lot of people dying every day for the last this week. I've heard about the death of so many people, people precious to me. And one of the things the enemy keep putting in my head now. Well. It's only you and your sister here. <laughs> oh, you, you have a distant relative here, but it's only your close relative here. But if, if, if you, what happened if she dies before you and you are left here on your own, what are you going to do? And I start thinking, well, I don't want to be here without you. <laughs> <laughs>